Good morning and welcome to worship here at Braddock Street Church where we love God in worship, love others in small groups, and love our neighbor in service. My name is Annalise Stevens Jennings and I'm so glad to be in worship with you here this morning. Special thank you to all of our wonderful musicians and our team of tech folks who make online worship possible for us. If you are new here today, or new in general, not just today, um, we have a digital contact card that you can find on Facebook. It'll be in that comment section and also posted to our Facebook page so that we can get to know you and you can get to know us. Please go ahead and fill that out. Remember that you can like and comment and share anything that you're seeing on our Facebook page and especially worship with other folks so that lots of people in our community can be blessed by the worship that we have here. Thank you for letting us know that you are with us and remember that I will be with you all in the comments section if you have prayer requests that we can lift up and add to our list for prayers this morning. Would you please join with me now in our call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord Call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And now please join me in our opening prayer. How majestic your name in all the earth, O Lord our sovereign. The heavens reflect your glory, and the earth proclaims the wonder of your loving care. In the fullness of time, you crowned creation with the birth of your Son. Continue your work of salvation among us, and form us into a new creation, that as we behold the vision of a new heaven and a new earth, we may sing your glory. Amen. Please join us now for our opening hymn. Jesus 
Griffin, thank you so much. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street Church, and let us hear now from the Word of God. Our scripture lesson comes to us from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. That which is, already has been. That which is to be, already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And at this time, we're going to worship God by offering our gifts to God. You see the instructions on the screen before you, you can give through the donate button there on the Facebook page. You can text to give at the number before you. You can go to our church's website and the giving page there. You can also just mail in your offering, and we always want to remind people, if you're worshiping with us from another congregation, please continue to support your own church. Let us worship God with our gifts. Master. 
Thank you again, Griffin. Today we continue our worship series, That's Not How This Works. The first week of this series we talked about that phrase, God must have needed another angel. Last week we talked about the phrase that we use sometimes, God helps those who help themselves. Today we're going to focus on the phrase that maybe you've even used yourself, everything happens for a reason. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us the gift of life. You have given to us the gift of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand our part in your plan for God's creation. Help us to be obedient, Lord, not because we feel we have to, but because we love you. Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit this morning. Amen. So I want you to imagine this morning the greatest gift you could possibly receive. Now, I'm not looking for the Sunday school answer, you know, the preacher wants me to say this. No, just whatever it is, you know, um, smartphone, new TV, new house, I don't know, just whatever it is. Every Christmas, my family asks me, you know, what do you want for Christmas? And my brain immediately goes to Lucy, the character in A Charlie Brown Christmas, after she psychoanalyzed Charlie Brown and diagnosed him with what is called pantophobia, the fear of everything, she confesses to Charlie Brown that it's okay. She said she herself gets depressed every Christmas because she never gets what she really wants. And Charlie Brown says, well, what is it that you really want? And Lucy responds, real estate. You see, I've lived in parsonages almost my entire life, and even as a child, hearing her say that, real estate. I realized, yeah, that's what I really want. Now, in our little game here, what's your favorite gift that you could just dream of? Imagine if I was given real estate and I refused it. Imagine if you got whatever it is that you're imagining, that you actually received that gift. It doesn't make any sense, but you could refuse it, not even take it. This morning, as we hear from Ecclesiastes, to put it in context, it's the ending of the most famous portion of Ecclesiastes, where the author writes, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter, 
under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. Uh, if you're as old as I am, you're probably more familiar with that through the band The Birds who made that into a popular song called Turn, Turn, Turn. But even just yesterday uh, at Graveside, I was asked to read those words. The understanding that God has a timing for everything that happens. That life has its ups and downs, but whatever that, the good times, the bad times, the timing of it remains a mystery to us. Here's what the author says this morning um, in chapter 3, verse 11. He, God, has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their mind. That's you and me, human beings. Yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God is active and how God acts and the timing of God's acts remains a mystery to we human beings. And in the face of that mystery, many of us take solace in the idea that even though we can't understand it, God must have a plan. There must be a reason for everything. And in Ecclesiastes, the author goes on to say, you see, he grasps for the same idea. That which is already has been. That which is to be already is. And God seeks out what has gone by. That which is to be already is, it's all predetermined. Ecclesiastes on the one side, hand wants to acknowledge that that the timing of these events and whatever God's plan might be it remains a mystery to us but God must have a plan right everything must happen for a reason and yet if you've ever been with a family or an individual in crisis they just received the news that somebody in their family or someone very close to them has died or or gotten a terminal diagnosis or their house has been destroyed by a hurricane or a tornado or something, you know those are not the words you need to be saying. I hope you know that, that everything happens for a reason. And yet there are Christians that believe this. We call it predestination. A dear friend of mine was attending a funeral years ago. It was a tragic funeral. A 20-year-old young man had driven off the highway in Henry County, Virginia and run smack dab into an oak tree and was instantly killed. This was a church of another denomination, I will say. This was obviously not United Methodist. As the pastor went into this very detailed description of how God had preordained this to happen, that at the appointed time, God had planted an acorn in the soil by the side of the road. At the appointed time, the road had been built. At the appointed time, God had nurtured this tree to become a mighty oak. And at the appointed time, this young man would be driving down the highway and lose control at just the right moment that God had appointed so that he would hit that tree and be killed instantly. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm that family, what he is describing for me is a God who has predetermined that my 20-year-old son is going to be taken from me. That doesn't bring a lot of comfort And in my estimation, it's not the God I know. Does God have a reason and a plan for everything that happens? This week, we just celebrated the 75th anniversary of the dropping of two, the first two atomic bombs on civilians. The estimates are roughly 150,000 people in those two events, dead. And each one of those numbers, 150,000, each one is a life taken because of a war. And each one of those lives taken is a family that is absolutely devastated at the loss. That was a climactic event in a larger event we call the Second World War that took about 500,000 American lives. And estimates are roughly 85 million human lives worldwide. Everything happens for a reason. You and I are in the midst of a pandemic. Is this all a part of God's plan? That roughly 750,000 people around the world would be dead from this one virus? And roughly 170,000 Americans? Is this God's plan? We believe that that God has some greater plan, yes. 
And we believe that God is involved in human events. But to what extent? Do you ever wonder about that? One of my favorite films uh, was a film called Gandhi, about the life of Mahatma Gandhi. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. And there's this one just humorous little scene as Gandhi and his friend Charlie, who Charlie is an Anglican priest, are walking down the sidewalk. Now, if you don't know, at the time in South Africa, if a person of color, like Gandhi, was walking down the sidewalk and Caucasians came in the other direction, the law said the person of color needed to step off the sidewalk and yield to the white people to walk by. As they walked up the sidewalk, three young white men were coming in the opposite direction. They were young men, you could just see it in their eyes. They were ready, you know, to be up to no good. And the altercation almost began as Gandhi refused to step aside. Remember, he's all about nonviolent resistance. They were saved from the moment because one of the boy's mother yelled from upstairs and said, he's already late for work, he needs to move on. As they walk away from the near altercation, Charlie, the priest, says, well, that was lucky. Gandhi says, I thought you were a man of God. Charlie says, I am, but I'm not so egotistical as to think he plans his day around my dilemmas. God is involved in what's going on, but do we completely trust that God is always going to deliver us? Is that God's plan to always deliver us in the moment and save us from any kind of suffering? To what extent is God involved? That God has a predetermined plan or, or some kind of plan? The question is probably best viewed in the biggest question. The one thing we know that God is up to, and that is the redemption of humanity. Redeeming hearts, yours and mine, one at a time, away from selfishness and sinfulness toward holy children of God. There are Christians who believe that that is predetermined. We call it predestination. I have spoken with Presbyterian pastors, Lutheran pastors, and others, and they've all tried to explain to me that you still have a choice somehow in predestination. I haven't been able to grasp that. We United Methodist Christians believe in what John Wesley, our founder, referred to as prevenient grace. God moves before us. Pre, meaning before, venio, the Latin word for, to come. It comes before us. It comes before our awareness. God is at work in our lives, loving us, nudging us in ways that we're not fully aware, offering us gifts that in the moment we might even refuse. We have that free will, that choice. It may not make any sense to refuse what God has to offer, but God does give us that choice. In reading on the differences, I turned to a Reformed theologian, and it was interesting to me the way he described prevenient and predestining grace in a way that made me more and more a Wesleyan. He said that in the predestining grace idea of the character of God, it is, that it is as though God is like a king or a queen, a monarch, ruling, and we move according to the monarch's will, right? And we all understand God is sovereign, But to people who believe in prevenient grace, like John Wesley and other United Methodists today, the idea is that God is more like a loving parent who nudges, who offers kindness and love, and the child then responds in love. And it's very hard to believe if God is more like a loving parent, to whom we refer to as father, right? It's not about the maleness of God. It's about that this is a relationship, a loving relationship. If God is more like a loving parent, then how in the world could God predetermine who is going to heaven and who is going to hell? How could we understand a loving God that way who predetermines those who would be eternally condemned? Provenient grace works more like this. It's like those of us who are parents who raise children, those of us who have ever been children. You know that a parent does a parent's very best. He or she tries to love the child as much as possible, to show the child the right way in the hopes that that child will respond not out of some sense of guilt, but in a trusting relationship with the parent that the parent has showed the right way to live. But we all know that when that child becomes an adult, they might, la- they might act like anybody's child but yours, right? They have that free will. 
it's also the differences between prevenient and predestining grace are also seen in the nature of the Christian life. In other words, if we're predetermined to reward or punishment, then why bother trying? And if God has predetermined what I'm going to do, then how am I guilty for my own sin? Think of the garden itself in Genesis. The man and the woman are there in the garden, and they have the choice to either listen and obey the Almighty God or take the advice of a talking snake. We all know what they did. Now, if they were predetermined to do that, how can you hold them accountable for their sinfulness? It was already preordained. Why even try? And so if you and I as United Methodist Christians don't believe in predestination, that God has predetermined what's going to happen with our ultimate salvation, do you think God really predetermined what you were going to have for breakfast this morning? Sometimes I, I run into Christians who think that God has predetermined every little thing like that pastor talking about God planting an acorn that would one day kill a 20 year old prevenient grace works like this God moves and hopefully we receive the gift and respond we are given the gift of life we may, may not be aware that it is a gift at first but hopefully we become aware later on and we give thanks to God to not to not receive the gift obviously to reject the gift doesn't make any sense does it we're given the gift of love in Jesus Christ. Sometimes that's express, expressed through the people who are around us, through family, through friends, through mentors like teachers and coaches. It can come from a neighbor. It can come from anyone. It's a gift from God. We may not acknowledge it at first. We may not even be aware. God's already moving, wanting us, hoping for us to respond. We could reject the gift. Doesn't make any sense, but we could do that. You might have even received the the love of God directly through prayer or some powerful spiritual experience. It wasn't through another human being. You felt the Holy Spirit touching your heart. You still have the opportunity, the free will to refuse that. Doesn't make any sense, but you could. Sometimes God even nudges lovingly to, to a call. Maybe it, it's a call to be kind to someone. Maybe it's a call to to serve Christ like on a mission trip. Maybe it's a call to be married. Maybe it's a call to be a parent. Maybe it's to a particular vocation, even ordained ministry. My own experience is God was nudging all the way. I wasn't aware of it most of the time. Finally, I call it the, div the divine two by four. God smacked me over the head because that's what I needed. And I finally responded. God moves first and we respond. It amazes me to think that people might believe that there's a reason for everything, a plan, a detailed plan for everything. Wouldn't God be bored watching us play out a script that he's already written? And if we're predetermined to love God, is that really even love? You want to know what God's plan is? The redemption of humanity. That's the big thing. One heart at a time. And it starts with you and me. Right? sharing the forgiving love of Jesus Christ in the hopes that we would respond. It's the greatest gift we could ever get. We could refuse it. Doesn't make any sense, but we could do that. That's God's big plan. That you and I would love like Jesus does. That when our neighbor is hungry, that neighbor gets fed. That we as human beings and as nations somehow, some way, no longer wage war on one another. That when there's a hurricane, and yes, they're predicting a record number of hurricanes this year, when a hurricane happens and our neighbor loses his or her home, there are people like Christians who've been touched by the love of God who want to love in return and love their neighbor in that way. The prayer says it all. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Make earth look like heaven. That's God's plan. And you and I have the free will to mess that plan up with things like wars, with things like selfishness and greed. That's God's plan. The details in between, as Ecclesiastes has already told us, we human beings cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It remains mostly a mystery to us. But I don't believe for one minute that God has a plan. And we see that, I mean a detailed plan, 
And we see that most often when we're hurting. Kate Bowler is a professor at Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. She's an author of several books. The one that this idea is called, that this idea is based on is called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I Have Loved. She writes about her own experience. She's put out a TED Talk. I encourage you to, to look at it. It takes about 18 to 20 minutes. And I've got excerpts here from it. But I want you to understand Kate's story. She was 35 years old. She had gotten her dream job in academia. I'm watching my son go through that process now, and I know how hard that is. It's far beyond the regular job interview, I will tell you that. She got her dream job. She was married to her high school sweetheart, and she had just had a baby boy, her first child. And when that child was about four months old, she began to have abdominal pains. And they ran tests, and they ran tests, and couldn't seem to find out what was going on until finally she got a call from a staff person at the lab that said, I regret to, re to inform you, you have stage four cancer. She said the first words out of her mouth, the only thing she could think of was, but I have a son. She was just beginning life in her mind. And so here's what she says. A few months after I got sick, I wrote about this and sent it off to an editor at the New York Times. In retrospect, taking one of the most vulnerable moments of your life and turning it into an op-ed is not an amazing way to feel less vulnerable. I got thousands of letters and emails. I still get them every day. I think it is because of the questions I asked. I asked, how do you live without quite so many reasons of the bad, for the bad things that happen? I asked, would it be better to live without outrageous formulas for why people deserve what they get. And what was so funny and horrible was, of course, I thought I had asked people to simmer down on needing an explanation for the bad things that happened. So what did thousands of readers do? Yeah, they wrote to defend the idea that there had to be a reason for what happened to me, and they really want me to understand the reason. People want me to reassure them that my cancer is all a part of a plan. A few letters even suggested that it was God's plan that I get cancer so I could help people by writing about it. People are certain it is a test of my character or proof of something terrible I've done. They want me to know without a doubt that there is a hidden logic to the seeming chaos. They tell my husband while I'm still in the hospital, that everything happens for a reason, and then stammer awkwardly when he says, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear the reason my wife is dying. She goes on to talk about what she did discover in the midst of her suffering, how she felt surrounded by God's love, mostly in the people who were all around her, the medical staff, her family, her friends, the letters, the cards, the expressions of love that just surrounded her and, and let her know she was not alone in the midst of this struggle. She never knew she was so loved. That too passed, you know, it became normal. She continued the struggle and here's how she finishes. So I can't respond to the thousands of emails I get with my own five-step plan to divine health and magical floating feelings. I see that the world is jolted by events that are wonderful and terrible and gorgeous and tragic. I can't reconcile the contradiction, except that I am beginning to believe that these opposites do not cancel each other out. Life is so beautiful and life is so hard. Today I'm doing quite well. Immunotherapy drugs appear to be working and we are watching and waiting with the scans. I hope I will live a long time. I hope I will live long enough to embarrass my son and to watch my husband lose his beautiful hair, and I think I might. But I am learning to live and to love without counting the cost, without reasons and assurances that nothing will be lost. Life will break your heart. And life may take everything you have and everything you hope for, but I believe that in the darkness, even there, 
there will be beauty and there will be love and every now and then it will feel like more than enough we don't know that everything that God has a plan for everything that everything happens for a reason what we know is love divine love that surrounds us in the midst of our struggles that's what we hold on to and try not to worry so much about the reasons or the plan that will always whatever if there is such a plan it will always remain a mystery to us what we know is God's love and as she said very often that's more than enough let us pray Holy God, I thank you that you have never let us alone, that you always, throughout our lives, in the beautiful times and the tragic, your love is made available to us directly through prayer and in ways that you are nudging and loving us that we're not aware in the moment, but we might come to realize later. Thank you for your love, oh God. Hold us close especially those of us who are hurting right now, those of us who are lonely in the midst of this pandemic, those of us who have loved ones and friends, or maybe we ourselves are victims. God, hold us close. In the midst of the mystery, may we always know your love is real. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us continue in a time of prayer and meditation. Let us continue in prayer. Holy One, we are so thankful for your presence with us and for your love. And we ask today that you would be with this very long list of prayers from our community. We know that your presence is with each name, each person, each issue on this list, and with those who asked for these to be named. For the family of Bishop John Yamas Yambasu, for Donna Nepp, for Marilyn Stutz, Sarah Hudson, Shara Athern, Cheryl Athern, Pete Machias, Ed Orndorf, Betty Orndorf, Jeff McKee, Jerry House. Eddie Pinkham, Denny Bromley, Naya Franz, the family of Jane Eddie Fields, John Goodlow, George Quarles, Wayne Dick, Mike Ricketts, George Morris, Adrian O'Connor, Stephanie and David McWhorter, Helen Anderson, Harold Madigan, the family of George Floyd, the family of Ahmad Aubrey, 
the family of Brianna Taylor, the family of Rayshard Brooks, Robbie Robinson, Dick Harmison, Wendell Dick, Elizabeth Staley, Joyce Fisher, Jane Parrish, Elizabeth Lee Alleman, Andy Chapman, Ryland Harris, Joanna Stobbs and family, Boyce Cashian, Danette Hayes, Ruby Cook, Austin Trail, Steve Corbett, Holly Ogilvie, Celeste Brooks, J.R. and Trent Eastham, Bill Rowland, the family of Thomas Manaphy, the Ames family, Paul Tester, Harold Ogg, Francis Lively, Jeff Roberts, Domingo Tor Dom Dominga Torres and family. For all of the first responders, grocery workers, truckers, delivery drivers, for the Valley Health medical staff and all of those who are helping to keep us safe right now during this pandemic, for those who suffer with dementia and their families and caretakers, and holy God, for all of those who are returning to school soon at any level of education. There's so many names and prayers on this list today, and God, we know that you are with us through it all. Thank you for your presence with us. And now we lift the words that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now please join with us in our closing hymn.
As you can see, next week, uh, well, right now, we're still collecting food for Bright Futures, and we have a ministry with children. It's one of the foci of our missions committee. And also, with regard to children, we know that uh, we're going to go back to learning in some form through the school system, and so next week, we're going to have a drive-through back-to-school blessing here in the alley and I think also in the circle, but we'll, we'll give you more details this week. But be prepared for a back-to-school blessing next Sunday after worship. But now, in the midst of life's mysteries, the beautiful and the tragic, go knowing that God's love surrounds you every moment. Go with the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.